right, welcome everyone to this uh, session again. Uh, it's a privilege to be able to present to you today and I thank you for tuning in. Uh, so just a bit of introduction, I'm Chris from uh, Kananga uh, and for those of you who are new to us, um, we run the, uh, the, actually the portfolio and investment uh, division. Uh, there are 13 of us here covering all sectors and markets. And for those uh, of you who are existing customers, uh, thank you for staying with us uh, and we hope that you continue to do so. All right, so today I think uh, we'll walk you through the market outlook for 2021. Uh, I think I'll do my best to present as much as I can in 20 minutes. Uh, but we'll just give you a, a bird's eye view of the whole process. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we focus a lot uh, in Kananga on the bottom-up stock research. But uh, today I think I'll talk about the macro side. And on the macro, I think we, we look at it through, you know, uh, our own framework, our own uh, lens. And today I'll show you some of the key factors that we look at uh, when making uh, actually a macro view. Uh, which is not to be driven so much by news flow, but to actually focus on the fundamentals. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So um, <clears throat> the first three things is the global market review, the outlook, and also the Malaysian market review before we uh, go into the fund performance. All right, next slide. Okay, first of all, the global market review. Next slide. Okay, I think uh, some of you have heard from the previous presenters that I think 2020 was quite an unusual year. Uh, some sectors did very well, some sectors did very badly. Uh, the same with the countries uh, as North Asia did uh, quite, quite quite well, actually, I think up double digit, uh, and some uh, even up, I think, 20 to 30 percent um, year to date. Uh, but actually, you look at the ASEAN markets, it's actually uh, down. Uh, you know, Singapore was down about 10 percent. Uh, I think the overall ASEAN index was down about 9%, and also Europe did quite badly. And one of the reasons uh, I think uh, I think Andrew highlighted a bit just now is that the actually this year was split between COVID winners and actually COVID losers. So the COVID winners, the stocks like the tech stocks, the internet stocks, those did extremely well. And you see the US indexes, the S&P 500, and also the China index indexes, the Tencent, Alibaba's, also did very well, and that supported the index. Whereas countries that does not have much tech like ASEAN uh, didn't do uh, as well. As for Malaysia, I think we fared uh, relatively okay uh, because of our healthcare sector, which is also a COVID winner, uh, which is the rubber glove sector, which you all, which you, I'm sure you all know. All right, uh, moving on to the outlook. Okay, next slide. So I think we'll start with the uh, US first and then talk about the three key economies. Uh, obviously I can't cover everything in this short presentation, but I'll show you what we look at uh, at Penanga when we look at the fundamentals. So I think the key is not to be so focused on the news flow, you know, what uh, Trump has said or what Biden is going to say, but I think more focusing on the growth uh, and inflation. Uh, because whenever you want to analyze an economy, you need to look at the fundamentals. It's in the rate of change in terms of growth and the rate of change in terms of inflation, and then the overall liquidity environment of, of that country. So starting with the US, we see a rebound in growth in 2021. I think the rebound will be the strongest uh, in actually the second quarter uh, of um, this year. So if you look at the chart uh, right in the middle there, um, I think the first line, unfortunately, I don't have a pointer here, but you can see that uh, the real GDP year on year growth for the second quarter of 2021 is actually 10.2%, which is one of the highest growth rates uh, ever uh, because of the actually low base uh, last year. So we see a strong pickup actually in the US from March onwards, and that will carry, uh, carry on to the second and third quarter and probably slow down a bit in the fourth quarter, right? Uh, next chart. So uh, this is evidenced by the uh, ISM PMIs. So PMI is the Purchasing Manufacturing uh, Index, one of the key indicators that we look at. This gives you a gauge of how businesses are making decisions. And I think we see a rebound in that chart, uh, which is uh, above the expansionary line of 50, and now it's uh, close to 60, which meaning businesses are on the expansionary mode. And this uh, supports our growth uh, rebound thesis. So the full year forecast uh, growth uh, by economists is I think uh, plus 4%. Uh, from a record decline of minus 3.5% last year. Uh, and also the fiscal policy is uh, very stimulative. Uh, last year they announced, uh, they started with 900 billion of stimulus, but I think as time has progressed, they have added more and more packages. And the recent one that actually they propose uh, is actually more than 1 trillion in terms of uh, stimulus. And this is a trillion with a capital T. Last time, you know, we used to talk about 500 billion as being a lot, but now actually I think the, the amount, the new normal is uh, in the trillions. Um, and the fiscal deficit of the U.S. is actually forecasted at 16% for 2020. So I think this fiscal uh, policy is one of the key reasons why the U.S. is expected to rebound strongly as well. Uh, next, ne next slide. Um, 
so aside from growth, uh, inflation, fiscal policy, we look, also look at monetar monetary policy uh, as one of our key uh, factors in our framework when analyzing countries. So monetary policy is supportive. Uh, the US Fed has guided that there won't be any rate hikes until 2023. And this uh, fancy slide here is just the uh, market implied probability, basically uh, based on looking at the Fed fund futures, what is the implied probability? And you can see that actually it's all uh, uh, zero there, basically a very, a very small probability that they will uh, raise interest rates this year and next year. So um, I think this will actually support the uh, stock markets uh, and also the economy. Right, uh, moving on. Uh, so a bit more on, on monetary policy. Um, I think they are also going to continue their balance sheet expansion. And what I mean by balance sheet expansion is that they are pumping money into the economy. So last year, actually, if you look at this chart here, this is the chart of the Federal Reserve balance sheet, which is the amount of money that the US Fed has released into the economy and it has circulating in the economy uh, over a period of time. So you can see the chart there, it says from 2017 to 2020, there's a big jump uh, in the last few years in the Fed, Fed's balance sheet in the form of QE. So last year, I think we closed the year at more than US 7 trillion uh, in terms of uh, assets circulating in the economy. And I think the Fed is still buying at a rate of 120, I think 280 billion uh, a month. So imagine that amount of money going to the economy uh, every month, right? Uh, next slide. After US, we talk about Europe. And then uh, before we talk about China, the three major economies in the world. I think for Europe, um, there's uh, nothing much to be excited about. Uh, unfortunately, it's actually a, a slow growth uh, environment. So even though there is a rebound this year uh, because of the low base last year, uh, remember that Europe was one of the hardest hit economies. I think overall, it's still going to be lesser than other countries. I think if you move on to the next slide. Yeah, you can see that um, the second point there that Europe was one of the hardest hit regions uh, by COVID-19. Uh, we saw that actually growth was negative 7.4. And for such a you know, big region, such a mature region, minus 7.4 is actually yeah, the most serious contraction we saw probably in history, if I'm not mistaken, outside of the world wars, of course. Um, but this year, it's expected to rebound 4.6%. But you can see that even though it's forecasted to rebound 4.6%, it's still going to be below uh, where it was at the end of 2019. Um, but of course, there are some uh, small positives, like you know they have uh, finalized the Brexit agree agreement, so that's no longer an overhang. Uh, but the Europe uh, has also come together and set up a recovery fund, and this is actually positive because previously Europe was quite divided. You know, sort of disagreements between Germany and uh, Southern, I mean Eastern Europe on, you know, whether the government should, you know, uh, provide more and more support. But actually, they have come to agreement that support is needed, and uh, probably that also has lead to uh, somewhat of a rebound in the European economy. All right, uh, next slide. So moving on from the fundamentals of growth uh, to uh, and fiscal policy to monetary policy. Monetary policy, we see the same thing as with the US. There is an increase uh, in money being pumped into the system. Uh, this is the ECB, the European uh, Central Bank's balance sheet. Uh, and it shows you that, uh, move on to the next slide. I have the numbers there. It shows you that it has um, increased by 50% in 2020. Uh, to 7 trillion euros, about 61% of GDP. So also in Europe, a massive amount of money is being pumped into the economy um, with uh, interest rates still at a uh, negative rate um, held by the central bank. So we can see that uh, the reason why they have negative rates is that you know inflation is of course uh, very low as well. Um, this year, I think expected to be a slight positive, uh, but if you look at it structurally, it's always been around you know zero to uh, 1%. Uh, next slide. So after moving on from Europe, we move on to the, the China, which is um, quite unique because it's actually the first and the strongest recovery. So if you recall, actually China was one of the first to be hit by COVID uh, and went into lockdowns in the first quarter compared to the second quarter of the rest of the world. So they were also the most aggressive in terms of containment. They had aggressive lockdowns. The government, you know, monitored the citizens very closely. Um, and that is, uh, although it was tough at first, but you know, that has led to uh, quite a big rebound. Uh, in, the, in the second half of the year. So we saw that actually China is one of the only key regions that had positive growth last year. So I think full year growth, I think the numbers are in as of uh, yesterday, I think it was two point something percent uh, positive for last year. So when you see US negative, Europe negative and Asia, the rest of Asia negative, I think China was positive uh, last year. So I think uh, that also helped the uh, Chinese stock market, uh, which is why you see some of the regional funds also doing very well. So I think for 2021, the rebound will continue. Um, 
market is forecasting about 8% uh, recovery this year. Uh, and this is uh, actually shown uh, in the data. We see industrial production, uh, fixed asset investment and retail sales also rebounding strongly in October, December, uh, November and December, right? Uh, next slide. So these are just two of the charts to show you the uh, rebound in the data. Uh, yep, next slide. But I think the key risk to watch in China is uh, policy tightening. Uh, I think, as you know, in China, it's a very uh, government dictated economy. So if they want to slow things down, they really can. Um, we saw that in 2018, for those of you who have been investing for a while, uh, would have obviously noted that 2018 was a negative year for markets and especially uh, the regional funds in China, because actually they actually uh, tightened the policy um, because they wanted deleveraging and they cracked down on shadow banking. I'm sure many of you have heard this uh, word shadow banking in, in 2018 and 2019 because of this uh, tightening policy that actually impacted markets. So actually the key to watch actually is uh, not so much growth. I mean, we know that growth is going to rebound, but actually what the Chinese government will do, which is whether they will tighten policy again or not. If you move on to the next slide. And your question is why would they want to tighten policies? Because the level of debt in China is very high. If you look at the chart on the right, it shows you the debt to GDP, uh, which is actually more than 260%. The total debt to GDP, including government, the private sector, uh, it's actually more than 260%, which is uh, very high for a developing country. And the increase in debt last year was actually uh, also um, a very high compared to the last 10 years. So I think the government is mindful of the, uh, the, the debt in the economy. And we can see that the rate of credit growth on the chart on the left, uh, the yellow line is uh, how we measure credit growth in China. Uh, although it has rebounded, but right now it's uh, started to flatten out and we have to monitor whether it you know, declines uh, uh, or not. But I think this year, the, uh, at least for the first half, we think that it's going to be okay. I think in, was it June or July, it's the 100th anniversary of the China Communist Party. And I think we, I don't think they will want to, you know, uh, tighten too much uh, too early, la, right? Okay, uh, next slide. So I think uh, overall to sum it up, uh, we have a synchronized global recovery uh, this year. Uh, together with abundant liquidity. And I think liquidity is what is driving the market. Uh, we saw that second half of last year, market's uh, performance very strong. Uh, into January, is still uh, fairly strong. And I think, I think for the next uh, few months and the first half, uh, at least, uh, the market should be supported by the abundant liquidity. So we, we see that the US um, uh, M2 growth, which is the money supply, uh, increased, um, I think, more than 20, 24%, more than 24% uh, last year. And the chart on the right shows you that the OECD excess liquidity is actually correlated to global equities. I'll move on to the next slide. So the abundant liquidity and low interest rates uh, and the low US dollar is actually supportive of global equities. <coughs> Sorry. So the OECD excess liquidity, uh, as what I mentioned just now, uh, shows you the basically the money supply uh, over the GDP, and it actually rose uh, sharply. Uh, with central banks in the G3, uh, meaning the actually the US, uh, Europe, and Japan, uh, increasing their balance sheet by more than 21%. And uh, on the chart on the right shows you the US dollar uh, index, um, the broad dollar index, and actually uh, weakening US dollar is actually supportive of emerging markets uh, equities. And because actually the global trade and uh, global investments are all mostly denominated, still denominated in the US dollar. So a weakening US dollar is positive. All right, so moving on. So of course there are some key risks. Um, there is, uh, it's not all uh, you know, fine and, and, and dandy. Uh, the risk is that actually there is a hiccup in the vaccination process uh, because right now the forecast of rebound is based on the forecast for herd immunity by third quarter in the developed world and for emerging world fourth quarter or first quarter of 2022. So if there are any major delays in vaccines, they will actually push out the, the recovery process. But currently it looks like it's progressing as planned uh, despite you know, uh, one or two small cases of uh, you know, uh, adverse reactions. And I think uh, the last point is more of uh, the, the most important uh, risk for the market is if the, the uh, you know, Fed tightens policy, uh, because actually, as like I mentioned, the global economy and the global markets is supported by actually this abundant liquidity environment. So if they start to raise interest rates or guide for a tightening policy, uh, this will also affect markets. But we actually don't think that will happen right now. Inflation is still low, uh, but we have to see what they say, you know, in the upcoming meetings, which they have uh, every quarter, right? So moving on to uh, Malaysia, the next uh, slides. Yeah. 
So I think for Malaysia, um, I think uh, we'll talk about a bit of the, the key trends uh, and the risks to watch. Uh, I think I'm mindful of time, uh, probably go through the uh, trends uh, quickly uh, and talk more about our investment strategy. So uh, moving on to the next slide. I think uh, this uh, commodity monetary policy is, a, um, is a, probably the same uh, meaning as the abundant liquidity is that interest rates are low right now. You know, if you put your money in FD, you need to get less than 2%. And so a lot of people actually are moving money into the markets uh, and also, you know, uh, increasing spending, which is positive um, for the economy. Okay, move to the next slide. Uh, basically, if you have lower interest rates, uh, basically money flows into risk assets in the hunt for high return. All right, next slide. Yeah, we can move on. So I think the second uh, key trend in Malaysia, aside from you know the low interest rates and liquidity environment, number two is actually uh, fiscal stimulus. So just like you know we saw in the US, Europe, we also have a fiscal stimulus here uh, to support consumption, which is impacted by COVID. Uh, we have about six point five billion in terms of the uh, the Bantuan uh, Riyadh plans. Uh, the EPF withdrawal, we're looking to add another, I think, twenty five to thirty billion there. So I think overall consumption is still going to be uh, fairly decent uh, this year, uh, despite uh, you know uh, the the recent uh, lockdowns. Can okay, move on to the next slide. Yep, continue. Uh, the third theme is actually a rebound in earnings growth. Uh, this is actually in line with a rebound in GDP. Uh, so as you can see that last year was quite a bad year for corporate earnings in Malaysia. Uh, on aggregate, down about fourteen percent. Uh, this year we see a strong rebound of thirty eight percent. I think a big part of that is the glove sector. Uh, glove earnings this year should be at a record high. Um, and also, I think there's a rebound in uh, the commodity sector like plantation, oil and gas, uh, and also the financials. All right. Uh, okay, next slide. And the fourth major theme is the low foreign shareholding. So I think the foreigners were net sellers uh, in the last six to seven years. Um, a lot of the uh, foreigners have exited the market. I think last year was a record selling. Um, we saw, I think if you move to the next slide, uh, there is uh, some numbers there. Yeah, last year was a record selling. I think it was, um, yeah, 30, 32 billion. Um, and actually that, sorry, 20, uh, 24.7, uh, that was last year. And actually that is one of the uh, highest we saw in the last uh, 10 years. And actually foreign shareholding is also at an all-time low, right? Uh, next slide. So given those, uh, you know, four major themes that you know, we have in the Malaysian market and what will be our investment uh, strategy. So investment strategy will be to focus on two areas. Uh, we call this a barbell strategy, where on one hand, we, you know, we like uh, the recovery team. So we have the recovery names like the financials, the commodities, uh, consumption and infrastructure. So that's uh, for your recovery portfolio. And then on the other half of the portfolio, you know, we focus on secular growth. What I mean by secular growth is that growth that is independent of, not to say independent recovery, but uh, it's more driven by external factors. So these are like long-term trends uh, that we see happening in the world. Uh, things like 5G, things like electric, uh, electric vehicles, uh, things like renewable energy, uh, and also the ESG uh, team. So this is one of the key areas we want to focus on as well. So I'll, I'll talk more a bit about this in the next slide. So next slide, uh, I think we can skip this. Um, on the recovery portfolio, we like uh, financials. I think uh, financials will be... Um, the most leveraged to uh, economic recovery. Uh, they have derated in the last two years uh, on the weak earnings. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, we like financials uh, on that. Uh, second is uh, commodities. So you see commodities that oil has also, uh, you know, rebound a fair bit to about $55 a barrel right now. Uh, CPO is hovering around 3,500. Of course, it's a bit volatile, but we can see that this pickup in these two key commodities that Malaysia exports would also uh, support the sector and also uh, the earnings of the uh, companies. Next slide. Okay, yeah, we covered this. All right, uh, the uh, third part of the recovery basket we like is the infrastructure play. Now, of course, infrastructure, I think, uh, is something that, you know, has been uh, on and off uh, in the last few years. But I think the key here is actually uh, more on the, actually is stock specific. Uh, of course, the sector, you know, there's always political noise. There's always news on whether a project is cancelled or not. But we see certain uh, stocks that have um, that are trading at very cheap valuations and that uh, actually things are improving uh, on the margin. Uh, so I think this is more of a, a stock-specific play uh, for the infrastructure sector. Uh, next slide. Uh, some of the key projects to watch is the MRT3. 
uh, I think HSR has been delayed uh, or actually postponed. Um, but actually, you see a lot of the local uh, property projects, I think, starting to uh, regain uh, steam and pick up this year. Uh, next slide. So uh, um, on one hand, you know, we have the recovery team. On the last, last hand, we have the uh, technology as well. So we like uh, actually the uh, technology sector. Uh, in Malaysia, there are a lot of actually uh, technology component uh, providers, uh, you know, based in Penang that are doing very well. Uh, global semiconductor sales is expected to pick up a lot this year. Uh, next slide. Um, and, then, and then I think this year uh, we will see actually EVs picking up uh, very quickly uh, and actually gaining mass acceptance. And so actually this is a new, not to say new, but a, actually a product that's going to drive uh, the actually usage of semiconductors a, a lot. All right, next slide. And also renewable energy. I think this is one of the key uh, focus of governments around the world. I think China has committed to carbon neutrality by 2050. I think Biden has also um, announced that he's going to focus a lot on renewable energy in terms of his uh, clean uh, uh, energy program. So we see a rise of spending in actually, um, you know, solar capacity and those companies which supply, you know, parts, supply equipment to, you know, uh, solar uh, companies who are expected to do well as well. And a lot of them are actually based in uh, Asia as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, yes, we talked about this. Uh, next slide. So I think, of course, uh, domestically, the key risk is, uh, of course, politics. Uh, you know, things um, right now is under the emergency order. But uh, if there's the election in the second half, you could see, you know, uh, you know, a few months where you know the market uh, sort of di digests the uh, uh, election. So I think this is also one thing that we're watching out for. Uh, next slide. Uh, we skip this. Okay, so I think the investment strategy, like I mentioned, is to focus on recovery team on the one hand. On, on the other hand, we focus on also the secular uh, growth uh, trends, uh, the technology sector that we like, and also the renewable energy. So I think this is one of the key focus areas. And the good thing about Asia and also Malaysia is that there are a lot of companies uh, that in the, in the global supply chain that supply to the semiconductor sector. A lot of the chip makers are based in uh, uh, Taiwan. Uh, in, in China, you have the... Uh, some of the key uh, internet companies and key you know mobile phone producers as well i think in malaysia there are a lot of part suppliers here as well so i think that there are a lot of you know uh, uh, high growth companies that you can look at uh, uh, across asia and, and, and i think this is also one of the areas that we're focusing on right uh, next slide okay so moving on to the the last part of the presentation uh, i apologize for rushing through a little bit because of, of time uh, but let's talk about fund performance and a bit of review uh, what we did last year. I think last year was a fairly uh, good year for us, uh, despite uh, everything. Like I mentioned, it's because of the divergence in performance. And so by focusing on, on the sectors that benefit uh, last year, I think uh, that contributed to our returns. So you can see a selection of our funds here. I think most of the funds did well. The, the larger funds, the more stable funds uh, did probably uh, slightly lower, high single digit to low teens. Whereas the more aggressive uh, small cap funds can, can see, you can see uh, even 20, 30, or even 40% uh, kind of return. Um, but like I say, you know, it's always advisable to have a diversified portfolio. Uh, you know, you need your core uh, holding of uh, actually stable funds to, you know, anchor your, your, your portfolio. And then also you need, on the other hand, maybe some aggressive funds. So, you know, the way I like to think about it is like, uh, you know, you have a football team, you have your defenders, you have your midfielders, you have your strikers. You know, you have your defenders, like your bond funds where you want to, you know, protect your downside. But you also you have your midfielders, your core holdings, like, you know, the Kananga Growth Fund where you want to, you know, uh, have a slow and steady kind of growth. And also you want some aggressive funds to give you that high return when the market is strong, uh, like the Growth Opportunities Fund, which is a small cap fund, or maybe even the uh, Asia Pack Fund. Um, which is a high beta um, a fund as well. So you need actually a mixture of funds in your portfolio to, uh, for, for all seasons, uh, right? So in the next slide, I think we just talk about a bit of our fund focus, Kananga Growth Fund. This is still uh, one of our key recommended funds and our core uh, holdings. Although, you know, it might be slightly lesser than those aggressive funds, but I think it's more of a slow and steady funds. And I think that over the last five, six years, uh, it's still outperformed the market by a, a large margin. Uh. And it's also the fund size is above a billion, so it tends to be more stable. And if you look at other funds which are you know, above a billion, we also uh, rank uh, fairly well. Uh -huh.